Welcome to Richard and Greg, a channel dedicated to discussion, debate and argument on a whole array of topics. In today's video, we discuss the Egyptian Empire, and Greg covers for us a whole range of dynasties within this particular empire, and this being the third episode of our Empires and Dynasties program. So let's listen to that discussion. Well, this evening, it's the 25th of October, 2020, and we're going to continue with our Empire and Dynasty series with Controversially Greg. Now, we've already covered China and Russia, and this evening, we're going to talk about the Egyptian Empire over a series of dynasties. So hopefully he's on the phone. Greg, good evening. Good evening. Actually, the Egyptian empire is fairly difficult to establish with any absolute veracity. But we're talking of serious agricultural development and the early parts of the Temple of Karnak being built somewhere around 1900 B.C., However, if you want to be politically correct, BCE, which means before the current era. In about 1700 BC, the Delta was taken control of, the Nile Delta, by Hyksos rulers, who were more or less the foundation of ancient Egypt. In 1600 BC, Amos unified the country effectively as Egypt. And in 1500 BC, Hatshepsut became Pharaoh. There were a series of pharaonic leaders, and the history is fairly confusing in the the ancient Egypt was in fact divided into three main periods, which don't really correspond with that information. The Old Kingdom was from 2700 to 2200 BCE. The Middle Kingdom, 2050 to 1800 BCE. And the New Kingdom, about 1550 to 1100 BCE, or BC if you prefer. The New Kingdom was actually followed by a period called the Late New Kingdom, which lasted to round about 343 BC. This is making it one of the longest effective periods of centralized governments that dominated its area, i.e. effectively an emperor, empire of any of the great empires. The empire and its great periods of building, such as the pyramids, the great pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx and the like, their actual dating is much under question nowadays with modern archaeological and geological dating points and abilities because it is now starting to be widely claimed that it really doesn't look as if the pyramids were built by the Egyptians because there are signs of water wear coming up quite a long way on the pyramids themselves and also for the time scale that is, has always been accepted, it realistically was completely and utterly impossible to have built those pyramids. So we are not as well informed on what was going on in Egypt as people would like to claim. It is thought by many 
that the pyramids were built long before Egypt as we speak of it, and possibly built by a much, much earlier civilization for a completely different purpose to that which we have tended to believe they were built by Egypt. It is actually a fascinating study in what is politically correct to believe about a society at a given point in time, because our knowledge of it is changing a great deal of the time. It is, for instance, believed that the Sphinx, as we now know it, was a completely different carving until it was struck, possibly by lightning or some other force, and the head was completely mutilated and recarved in its present shape. It is also mystifying that it would seem that the area where it was built and where the pyramids are was fairly deeply underwater, at least three or four meters underwater for a long period of time, sufficient to cause erosion on these structures. It is possibly believed, and I say possibly, it is a point of speculation that in fact, all the hieroglyphs on the various temples and the great pyramids and the like was carved possibly thousands of years after the structures were built. So if you want to study in confusion, I think it will probably take you the rest of your lifetime to find out the absolute truth on this. So I make no claim that what I'm saying is correct any more than a qualified Egyptologist could make such a claim. It is a theory most of the time. Egypt dominated a vast tract of land for its day in that it dominated the eastern end of the Mediterranean, deep into what we now call the Middle East, and across North Africa and down into Sudan and Ethiopia. So it had a large empire under its control. It is also very confusing, and particularly at the moment, that there is much political correctness going on about the aim to do a remake of the story of Cleopatra and the fact that it should be an Egyptian taking the part when the actress taking the part is being taken as the actress for that part based very much on her looks and her acting skills rather than her national origins. As I understand that although she calls herself a Czech, her origins are Ashkenazi Jewish, so she is from the eastern end of the Mediterranean, so she would be a correct individual to have acting the part of Cleopatra, or more correct than many others. But let us not forget that Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. When it comes to the crunch, she was a Greek who was the ruler of Egypt at the time. So the entire history is a complete muddle. Well, Greg, that's quite fascinating because I didn't realize Cleopatra was, was a Greek. That said, we started this discussion with my saying we're going to cover a number of dynasties. Would you like to highlight then throughout the Egyptian empire, the range of dynasties and to some degree, how they compare with other traditional empires, if you can. I'm not sure I can with any degree of accuracy because so much of it is theory and based on opinions that seem to be changing at a fairly great rate of knots, at the particularly at the moment. And when I say 
that Cleopatra was Greek, to be more specific, she is from an area of Greece, as it was then, known as Macedonia. So to be technically spot on accurate, the actress is Ashkenazi Jewish, who was de- whose ancestors were deported from what is now Palestine to Europe, probably as slaves, and she is descended from them, it is understood, having ended up as a family in Czechoslovakia, which of course is now split into two areas, the Czechs and the Slovaks. So even that is muddled. And Cleopatra, her origins, as I say, were from Macedonia. It is difficult to, in any clear way, explain the details of the different dynasties. And I recommend that anybody sufficiently interested does some of their own research on this. It is a fascinating subject. But Egypt was really split into three different dynastic groups. But also, to add to the confusion, Egypt was split into three major regions, Lower Egypt, Middle Egypt, and Upper Egypt. Thus, the history of ancient Egypt is in fact divided into three main periods. That old kingdom, 2700 to 2200 BC, the Middle Kingdom of 2050 to 1800 BC, and the New Kingdom from around 1550 to 1100 BC, as we said earlier. These are fairly theoretical as dates and are based on current research. So it stretched for a period of self-rule in Egypt and control of its own destiny and control of its adjoining lands and countries around the area to somewhere in the region of two and a half thousand years. The new kingdom and the days of the final rulers of Egypt, such as Ramesses, was around two thousand, two and a half thousand years, including Tutankhamun and the like. It was an interesting society in that with the power for the pharaohs, their life was sabaritic. And if you take Ramesses the Great or Ramesses the Second, he had a reign of 67 years and died in about 1213 BC at the age of 96. He had nearly 200 wives and concubines who bore him 96 sons and 60 daughters. So I should imagine there was a fair amount of squabbling when he died as to who inherited what. But as a society, not only was it involved in great building enterprises, many of which were surrounding a cult of death in veneration of the dead, hence the many great graves that have been found with the great wealth of the principal individual in that grave. But it also involved the worship of a number of different gods, deities that all fell below the great deity of the sun god, Ra. One of the great achievements of the Egyptian society, empire, dynastic structure, whatever you wish to call it, would seem to have been that they introduced a form of universal social benefits and taxation to fund it, in that the land was owned by the pharaoh, 
he levied a tax on the land and the produce of that land, the grain and the like, was handed to the pharaoh and his armies of effectively tax collectors who then held the, that grain and in throughout the period when the farming was not taking place, people worked for the pharaoh or alternate way of looking at it is they worked for the state, building the many huge temples, etc., uh, that we know as Egypt today. Most of these seem to have been for the purpose of venerating the dead, who were incarcerated, entombed in these buildings, along with much of their wealth, their possessions, and in many cases, many of their servants. The tombs were sealed, and it would seem that the religion expected a day of resurrection, and the grave goods were to ensure that the resurrection was to the comforts and benefits that people had enjoyed during their first life on earth. This continued until the end of their power as they started to disintegrate and then during the next almost thousand years the Nubians, the Assyrians and the Persians ravaged and pillaged increasingly what had been the Egyptian Empire and when Pharaoh Nectanebo the second retreated to avoid death at the hands of oncoming Persian invaders in 343 BC. He was effectively the last Egyptian born pharaoh. And that was the end of the two and a half thousand years of Egyptian self rule. Well, can you perhaps explain, Greg, why they buried their servants and very often their possessions? when these pharaohs actually died. What was the sort of theory behind that? We understand, modern thinking is, in other words, that they were buried in veneration of the principle, namely the given pharaoh or the given power who had died, and servants, a number of them, would be put to death and mummified, many of their wives or Spouses would also face that fate, together with many of the grave goods, which were mainly in the form of wealth. And there were literally hundreds of what are called ushabti, which are the small images, usually about six inches long, of mummies, the mummified bodies. And these all, each one, represented a given individual in the court and the belief was that when resurrection came all of these people and all of these goods and all of the wealth that was buried with them would also be resurrected at the same time thus creating a new pharaonic structure in the new world of the dead. That would seem to have been the aim, and it was a concept of superstition, or if you call it, would rather call it, a concept of a belief and religion that lasted for between two and three thousand years. So it rivals the religions of today and the various superstitions that surround them. And for this to have happened from almost 5,000 years ago is pretty astonishing when you think how advanced the society was then. When the mummies that we currently see in museums, Ramesses, for instance, who, whose mummified body is on display, in a display case, 
on the second floor of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and it is 3,000 years old. It is fairly astonishing. When you think that for all our grand pretenses as human beings and all our self-importance, every single power grab in history has occurred on this planet with no recourse to anywhere else and people have fought and killed and maimed and abused people for a transient period of history it is a very small outlook on life we do rather overrate our importance in my opinion and you will find that the Egyptians were at one of those very early stages of developing these superstitions that we now call religion. The Babylonians had a different outlook, as did the Zoroastrians and the various other earlier incarnations of what we call religion. Okay then, Greg, putting your views on religion aside for just a moment, how does this particular dynasty compare in terms of success, if one can do that, with the likes of the Russian or the Chinese dynasty? Oh, I say dynasty, sorry, I meant empire. How, how do they compare? I think in terms of their edifices, their structures, their many innovative aspects of social well-being where the peoples were employed to work for the state and paid out of the taxes that had been levied on them so that they didn't starve to death due to mismanagement of their finances and ensured that they had seed grain for the new season provided by the state. Egypt was innovational, it was powerful, it created great wealth, but there have been, a, as you say, Russia, China, or for that matter, the great emperor of Mali, which spread right across what we now know as sub-Saharan Africa at much the same time as the Egyptian structure was in its heyday. So they have outlasted, in terms of what they have left behind, all of those earlier dynasties, with a few exceptions. And when I say a few exceptions, such as the army of figures that was buried by the early Chinese emperors or dynasty of its day and some of the earlier Russian edifices, though they are not as notable and they are much more modern. I think Egypt must be seen as one of the great successes on this planet, that it still doesn't exist, or should I say, it doesn't exist to this day as a great empire, is not to be misjudged as it having been a failure overall. Great empires always come to an end as other empires rise and absorb them or conquer them. And on that note, Greg, I think it's a great time to round up. Thank you very much. Have you any idea what our next empire is going to be? Or what are you contemplating? Well, I think we should possibly at some stage a look at the general structure of Africa and its development at the need of the Western world, particularly America, to destroy Muammar Gaddafi and his long reign in Northern Africa and the consequences of some of those actions. Africa is an emerging structure, whether you call it a problem or whether you call it a power, it does affect a great deal of the world, an increasing amount, especially with the current African Middle Eastern invasion of surrounding countries, whether that is as an army of invasion or an army of job seekers, that is slowly overwhelming its neighbours, 
it is a force to be reckon, reckoned with, whether deliberately being forced on people or as a matter of circumstance. It is a consequential situation that has to be addressed. So maybe look at Africa. Right then, Greg, that sounds good to me. Well, let's meet up perhaps later in the week and we can perhaps get that one out this week rather than waiting a week as we did last time. Which is Sorry about to... the delays. Well, you, you were delayed for a couple of weeks and I had my own technical issues as well. But hopefully they're all resolved now, though I still can hear slight sort of clanking in the background, but hopefully that won't show too strongly on the recording. Greg, thank you very much. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed that discussion, and if so, kindly subscribe to our channel and press the bell sign so that you are notified of our videos as and when they are published. And also in the description box below, we place links to certain books, articles, and programs which you may find of benefit and for which we will receive a small commission should you purchase through our link. And this will help support our channel and to enable us to develop it further.